given by Dr. Alessandra Curioni uh, from Medical Oncology at the University Hospital on immune checkpoints. Good morning. It is my real pleasure to be here and to give you an overview on immune checkpoints because what you have heard is that we need to understand, to discover first, but also to understand what is the function of all of these molecules. And it is pretty complex. Well, we know that a T-cell activation needs to, be, to, pre, to see an antigen in the presence of an antigen presenting cells, but also needs a stimulatory um, pathway to be activated. And this is with the B7, 1 and 2 molecules interacting with a CD28. Now, this is not the only molecule fundamental in the activation of the T cells. There are several others which can be characterized as inhibitory molecules or stimulatory molecules. And these are there not just to be a target for treatments, but they are there physiologically to finally tune the response, the T cell response and the immune responses in general. We could actually characterize them not only by their function, but also by their structure. And you can have here an example of the TNF family receptor ligands. And uh, I will talk about these first, because most of them are part of the stimulatory molecules, as for example, CD40 and so on. CD40, in fact, uh, it is, a, a, you can see here, present on the dendritic cells and the ligand on the T cells. Well, the activation of this pathway is not only important in the first phase of a T cell activation, but also afterwards in the interaction between T cells and B cells. But let's see, first of all, what happens between T cells and dendritic cells. The expression of this molecule will lead to the activation of the T cells, but at the same time will also lead to the maturation of dendritic cells. It is usually said that the dendritic cells are going to be facilitated by the activation of the CD4040 ligand pathway to do their function and sustain the presentation of the antigen. You can see it here summarized. And as we said before, also at the level of the T cell interaction with a B cell, the activation of this pathway is fundamental and the B cells for the maturation of them and the um, immunoglobulin switching, as well as the development of uh, germinal centers. Now, OX4040 ligand, it sounds very similar, but uh, it is completely different. And if we would like to summarize uh, the T cell response in three phases, we could say that there is an expansion phase, you probably have heard before. There is afterwards actually a contraction phase where the T cells are going to uh, undergo apoptosis. And then there is a memory phase. Now, in the expansion phase, the T cell has encountered the antigen and is going to um, get induced to a clonal expansion towards this antigen. After the apoptosis, which is needed because in order to leave space for other T cells in the absence of the first antigen, few of them, few of these T cells will become memory. And OX4040 ligands is fundamental in this first expansion phase and in the reactivation of the memory T cells. Let's have a look at it in detail. The expression of 40 ligand is found upon antigen simulation on the uh, naive uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells, but also on the regulatory C T cells. The expression of the ligand by themselves, it is on APCs and after recognition of the antigen on the T cell for the T cell T cell interaction. Now the function on the effector T cells will be to the clonal expansion, what we said before the first phase, and on the memory T cells on the reactivation, what we said on the third phase of the T cell response. I would like also to point out uh, an important uh, uh, function of CD4040 ligand pathway on the T regulatory cells because it has been demonstrated that the activation of this pathway is going to lead to an internal mechanism and downregulate CTLA4 and FOXP3. Therefore, on regulatory T cell by inhibiting these two molecules, inhibiting the function of the regulatory cells. Well, if we thought, if we think about that these first two molecules are important in the first phase of the T cell activation, GITR is much more important in the later phases. What can you see is that GITR is expressed on several different cells. And if you have not heard that much of GITR, I would like to say that the University Hospital Zurich and the Cancer Center is going to start a clinical trial targeting GITR and um, for several tumor types. 
Now, Kitri is important at the, on the level of the T-regulatory cells because it diverts T-cells actually to a helper, to a TH9 phenotype. And on the other, uh, at the same time, it's also important on the T-effector cells. And as you can see here is the interaction with the effector cells uh, and uh, the um, accessory cells by increasing the survival of them and, in, and moreover uh, helping on the CD4 helper function. Last but not least, uh, CD137 by the stimulatory molecule. Why CD137? Um, I think it's pretty important because we have a clear example of uh, how much we probably don't know until we don't go into clinical trials when we do target a molecule. CD137 is expressed on many different cells. It's broadly expressed on T cell, T rex, D uh, dendritic cells, and NK cells. And uh, um, several clinical trials have been started and on phase two, and for example, renal cell cancer with antibodies targeting CD137. If we know that, CD137 is important on the level of the T-regulatory cells by reducing their infiltration, but also on the NK cells by helping their function, as well as on the T cells by increasing the um, proliferation and the presence of the T cells, as well as on the dendritic cells, we would think we could understand probably how so toxic could have been uh, this treatment. And ongoing are clinical trials using 3137 in combination with other treatment, but with much lower dosage. You can have here a small overview of some of the treatments that are uh, ongoing and on clinical trial. Now, if we move to the inhibitory signals, um, I like to uh, show usually this, this cartoon because it summarizes the effect of the inhibitory signals I'm going to talk to you about. First of all, CTLA4. CTLA4 is an homologue of CD28, and therefore it competes with CD28 to bind to the B7 molecules. And then I will talk to you about PD1 with ligand PD1, L1 and PDL2 that directly has an activity to the uh, T cell receptor. And third, I would like to uh, mention the LAG3 as inhibitory molecule, not only because uh, um, it has a completely different function by uh, blocking the MHC class 2, but also because we will also soon start uh, a clinical trial in the Cancer Center Zurich uh, with a uh, clinic of dermatology and oncology for the different tumors using uh, LAG3 antibodies. CTLA-4, you must probably know this molecule. CTLA-4, it's immediately um, activated this pathway and the presence of this molecule when the first antigen stimulus comes uh, on the, uh, after, upon a T cell activation. Why is this happening? It's because at the same time, an, a stimulus is going to um, look for um, a control and uh, a final tuning of the T cell, as I mentioned to you before. So while we have a stimulus of uh, like CD44 T ligand, we will also have the CTLA4 present on the cells, uh, on the activated dendritic cells. And uh, what we know is that on the activation of the T cells, this CTLA4 will uh, block, uh, the, um, will start at the inhibitory program by blocking the proliferation of the T cells. But it's also important that on T regulatory cells, it is CTLA4 present, and it will simply aggregate around the dendritic cells, inhibiting the function of presenting the antigen. Um, so as a summary here, you can see on the T regulatory cells and on the effector cells, the function of the CTLA4. I will move to the PDL1 and PD1 pathway, and this is a completely different activity as I've shown you before compared to the CTLA4. While CTLA4 blocks the stimulatory signal, PD1, PDL1 pathway blocks the TCR signaling, the TCR receptor signaling. And in fact, if we look at this cartoon, and you will see here the PD1 <coughs> on the T cell um, interacting with the PDL1 on the antigen presenting cell or on the tumor cells. Um, you will see that the direct activity is to induce apoptosis of the T cell, induces the down regulation of the already activated T cells, and reduce also the capacity of these uh, cells uh, to kill the tumor cells. We have heard before that there are molecules that are not heterogeneously expressed on the tumors, but there are molecules like PDL1 that also fluctuates in their expression on the same tumor.
PDL1 is expressed in several hematopoietic and non hematopoietic cells, and uh, for example, as well as on tumor cells, but it's also induced from some cytokine and it can be as well as downregulated from some others. What is pretty important is that uh, PDL1 expression, you can see here is the control, can be induced in their expression by hypoxia, so low oxygen conditions, or by high interferon gamma uh, molecule. Where do we find high interferon gamma? after the activation of the T cell. So as well, again, the first uh, stimulus of the T cell could also induce interferon gamma and could also induce PDL1 expression. But I would like to uh, show you one paper which I would uh, uh, warmly recommend, is that while we think that these molecules are important only on the immune system and on immune system cells, they might have also a direct function on tumor cells. And this is the example for PDL1 in a, a recently published paper. PDL1 expressed on the tumor cells shows to compete uh, glycolysis with, uh, for glycolysis with T cells. What does it mean? If we have uh, sugar, glycose, in the, in the stroma, this is going to be competing. The T cells are going to need in them as well as the tumor cells, and they would compete because of the PDL1. And uh, moreover, showing that the PDL1 present presence directly activates uh, the um, an, uh, anti-apoptotic signal on the tumor cell themselves. So therefore, targeting PDL1 might have a double effect. First, on the immune system, and second, a direct anti-tumor effect. And this is going to be analyzed further and, um, uh, in several studies. Now, let's conclude with LAG3, because if we thought that it was complex until now, LAG3 is for me the typical example of a uh, high level of complexity. Because LAG3, from one point of view, from the first, uh, at first it competes with CD4. You know that CD4 interacts with MHC class 2, so this is going to compete with a, um, uh, with a CD4, and therefore it's going to uh, block the, um, uh, the T cell activation of CD4, the proliferation, and at the same time it would also lead to a Treg um, function of the CD4 T cells. But what is interesting is that there is a soluble form of LAG3. And when it is soluble, this form is going to be an immunoadjuvant. Therefore, it becomes a stimulatory signal for the MHC. So I think I wanted to conclude with this uh, molecule just in order to explain you how complex it is. And when we think how we want to treat the patients, we also have to think about how these molecules do really work. Thank you very much for your attention.